G'day from down under again. I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, engraving with Pathpilot's uh, conversational software and make a few video notes and um, hopefully it'll document a few little tips on basic engraving using D-bits and um, could be handy for me too if I get any more forgetful. Well let's talk about engraving cutters for a minute. Traditionally they were D-bit shaped cutters ground out of high speed steel or nowadays better still tungsten carbide and um, they have a single cutting edge so let's just draw the essentials here so it's a capital D shape and uh, okay let's just draw it tapered like so so you start off with a piece of round can you see that okay start off with a piece of round split it exactly in half basically so you've got a D shape grind a taper on it now that wouldn't cut very well because you need clearance so then you rotate the cutter slightly and grind this angle here clearance away from the normal radius and then back it off like that so that's the shape so there's your front clearance there's your top rake and then on the end you typically grind it clearance there and clearance back down underneath so that see if I can show it here is that focusing so you grind you, you can lap that that end with it with a a diamond lapping hone this hone and stone for example this one which is super fine the blue one is very good um, and that is lapped just trying to hold it up to the camera with a little bit of clearance underneath and a little bit of clearance back that way just a few degrees or you end up with a really fragile point um, typically this is ground in a small what's called a D-bit grinder which has a collet that rotates here's your cutter that could be a broken um, carbide end mill that you just grind in the D-bit cutter and you would grind it by swinging the cutter against the um, diamond wheel and first of all will it, will it sit round at 90 degrees and grinding the flat on it to split the diameter in half to form the D-bit and then it's rotated to grind the taper and then it's set over on the angle of rake and that's cut on the side and rotated away to give you the back off clearance um, but if you don't have one of these machines um, obviously that's not an option but they're, they're not too expensive now they're made in China for a uh, government subsidized price um, but also you can get a, a cheap bench grinder um, and pick up a diamond wheel on eBay or something similar um, for quite a low price and do a lot just by freehand grinding and uh, diamond lapping with that stone or hone as I just explained Okay, I've just done a little engraving trial and um, with a little cutter that is uh, 0.7 diameter similar to the one I've got there a little smaller and I've gone 0.3 deep um, I've engraved that 916 so just to give you a bit of a background on what we're trying to achieve so um, the XY coordinate I've set through the middle of the text that's the y-axis and the x-axis is underneath the baseline of the text okay so looking up at Pathpilot just going through it quickly okay we've got an engraved trial G54 calling it tool number 14 maximum RPM 
which is really a bit slow. We, we really ideally want to be running at in steel at least 10,000 RPM, but that's as fast as it'll go. And that's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with running a cutter like that too small, as long as the feed rate is set slow, so the whole job takes a little longer. Um, so we've got a slow feed rate of 40 millimeters a minute. Um, you only need to clear at its Z height of about one millimeter, otherwise you're wasting a lot of time traversing up and down to the clearance level. So going to some of the data entry, I've gone for the free mono, which is seems about the narrowest of the different fonts. We've entered in our 916. The font size is set as a height, six millimeters from top to bottom. That's the overall height. Um, we've selected the positioning or the orientating of the text as center. So that's the y-axis I've just drawn um, in the middle of the text and we've set the baseline as zero. So then we can just set the um, cutter over the job um, in the position we want to be for the x-y-axis and then just enter zero on the DROs at that place and come down with a piece of paper and just touch the cutter and enter 0.1 for say our Z height. Um, we're going to give it a depth of cut of 0.2 because this is just a single cut operation and we don't want to go too deep and um, overload the cutter with a big cut. Remember we're talking a tiny little fragile carbide cutter here. So we should be ready now to post that to file and give it a little trial. Okay, so I've set the cutter, it's a 0.7 carbide debit cutter on, set it up for X, Y, Z, zero. We've set up path pilot. We've uh, loaded the program. We can check the graphics here. It's quite a good idea to put it on the ISO view and then expand it up as big as you can and you can see the layout. You're covering about a 17.4 millimeter length and a six millimeter height um, and where to go and you can see the depth of cut here is 0.2 of a millimeter so that's quite a good double check okay so let's push the button and hope all is well <laughs> easier to see it on the screen. As far as I can see, all of the fonts are double line fonts. And that means it's taking two cuts side by side to produce the font. Well, I would rather have some of the fonts with just a single line font. So Mark, if you um, get to listen to this video, please take note, would you be prepared to produce a few fonts that are just single line fonts? The advantage of that is you can have a much narrower engraving for very small engraving, for mold engraving. Um, there's a limit to how small your cutter size can be and still be durable. Okay, so trying to get the light to shine a bit better on this. Um, so let's say a half a millimetre wide cutter is as small as you can go. And if you've got a double line, then it's going to generate um, a engraving width of a millimetre. And that's too much for some fine engraving, for jewellery engraving or mould engraving. So please produce some fonts, some fonts that are just single line fonts. And that seems to be holding up okay. So that's um, a cutter that's 0.7 wide, running at 5,100 RPM, and a traverse feed rate of 40 millimeters a minute. It just took a couple of minutes to cut that shape. It's not throwing up a burr, so that's good indication that it's not it's not traversing too fast. This is in steel. It's in tool steel. 
01 gauge plate tool steel um, so that's quite fast um, for, for that particular application for a slow RPM I wouldn't want to risk running it any quicker than that but hopefully that will last up and engrave the various parts I've got to do okay this is showing it again in better light a bit of natural light on it quite a good finish the cutter seems to be holding up okay so I'll see how it goes after it's cut several more if you want to engrave deeper than say 0.3 or 12 thou on one cup there is not the facility within the conversationals to do that in one step but you can do another um, another program with the conversationals one at say 0.3 deep and one at say 0.6 deep and append it to the file so it will run one set of code in the first file and then carry on into the second file and run the second set of code 0.60 or uh, 24 power deep because there's a limit to how deep you can go with a D-bit cutter especially in steel um, if you overload the fragile tip it'll just crumble away and it won't last up just doing a run of parts on the Mini 1100 setup I've got here, something I learned today, I'm doing some heavy milling um, with a TTS system and most of you all know the TTS system pulls up on a flange here, it's really important that that flange is fully engaged and in contact with the bottom of the spindle and it's not a bad idea to check, where is it, where is it? not a bad idea to check with a feeler gauge in that gap if you're doing some heavy machining check in that gap to make sure the flange is fully in contact with the bottom of the spindle because I was getting some really bad chatter and I checked that and found that either due to the chatter or because I hadn't tightened the drawbar really hard enough in the first place that flange wasn't fully in contact the moment I re the moment I re-engaged that flange in contact, um, the, the chatter virtually went away. So you get a lot more stability with the TTS flange in contact with the end of the spindle, and it needs to have good molybdenum grease on the thread and on the thrust washer, and be done up really tight. Um, otherwise, it'll creep down and start flexing and it'll rattle its way out and you'll have a meltdown disaster. <laughs> 